Tom Whittemore a note. Look for it. Got it. Hello there. Welcome aboard the SBAU Astro Hour, everybody. It's our weekly vlog podcast. Vlog if you're watching, podcast if you can only hear us. It's on Zoom, live from our man caves and I guess computer dens. Astrophysics freaks everywhere we're catering to, and we feature folks from the South Coast Longtime Telescope Club. I'm proud to be part of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, SBAU, headquartered and ready to welcome you as a member at the beautiful Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History up in Mission Canyon, Santa Barbara. And my name's Ron Heron. I'll greet the guys here in a minute here. Our 131st program here of the SBAU Astro Hour for August 21st through the 27th. And the Hillary horrible hurricane mostly missed us we kind of dodged a bullet here are what we're going to talk about today it's amazing we got our regular lineup of planets and the first phases of the moon pegasus the winged horse up there and among the 88 constellations its nose is a messier object number 15 that happens to be a globular cluster we'll talk about that this hour an amateur japanese astronomer found a comet it's swinging in to go around the sun it's really moving and it's just a couple of weeks old from finding it what happens to a neutron star a lot of them become deadly magnetars of course they're all deadly if you get close to them there's a star out there we've leaned on and frowned out kind of heavy on helium we're going to talk about it it's destined to become one i guess the esa going to follow up on the nasa dart collision with an asteroid and look inside and see how it worked. We're going to learn something about galaxy shape shifting, including our own. And we found a new surface feature, some structures on Mercury. And this hour, I wonder if there's one that's sleepy. Ah, here comes Tom Whittemore. But let me introduce you to the president who's in control once again, Jerry Wilson. Hello, Jerry. Good morning. And hey, we're with each other. And Jerry has uh, been president for six seven years you know i'm gonna to have to run new elections in about three months in december but we got our speakers all ready to go it's good talking with you in the dark the other night while the people showed up almost 450 i think at the museum for a second 435 435 man. Oh. i love the new ones you know they're just awestruck and speaking of chuck mcpartland who was there at the beginning the outreach coordinator wife pat just like Jerry Wilson's wife is Pat Forge. Uh, Pat is a merchandise manager, Mrs. McBartland. Tom Wedemore is a retired. Made it. What? Yeah. I made it. You yeah. did. I had a doctor's right. appointment. Tom is uh, married to Maureen, and he's a retired former Westmont College science instructor, editor of the newsletter. Welcome aboard. Looks yeah, like thank you, Jerry, for the article. Oh, oh, you're welcome. Good. Yeah. What's the article, yeah. the article in and the newsletter going to be about? Chuck is up there playing with his Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what's the article you wrote about? Oh, it's in the newsletter. Yeah, I know that, but what's the topic? Jerry, it's up to you now. Go ahead. <laughs> you <laughs> do not remember? <laughs> no, I, I remember. I just don't you? know where to start. <laughs> about you, oh, I started with a quote that uh, <laughs> attributed to a lot of people, but um, that the universe is stranger than we know and possibly stranger than we can know. And I said, yeah. but we are making progress on it. We have, with uh, Isaac Newton's uh, three laws of motion and stuff, we use that now to send spacecraft out into the, the void and land on Mars. And two of them went out into interstellar space. And in the 20th century, through mathematics, we've learned that um, we've developed quantum mechanics and um, uh, relativity. And I talked very briefly about that and then um, point out that the, those two addressed slight changes, slight anomalies in uh, Newton's view of things. And so from those little, extent, they extended the range of our common uh, everyday experience physics laws. They extended the range to very big objects, um, black holes and stuff and and also down to sub microscopic things we couldn't see 
And I said, and now we're on the threshold of it again because we have little things that we're all of a sudden surprised by, uh, things seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And um, the muon magnetic moment does not match the, um, what's the theory about that? The theory of everything, the, <laughs> help the me out standard model. Chart. Standard model, thank you. Yeah. And, and um, Chuck comes along behind me with a wheelbarrow full of words I can't find. <laughs> so uh, the, um, and also there was one other thing that, anyway, so I, I just say that the, the, the show isn't over yet, folks. Well, you know, you're going to have to do one based on uh, Einstein's statement, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Okay. We don't have time to talk about it now, but uh, I've always wondered. The most interesting that. thing about that is how Einstein refers to God. You know, um, when Einstein talks about it, he just anthropomorphizes nature. And it's basically the God of Nietzsche that he's, um, I think that's the one that he he works, he is assuming. Because someone asked him, what does he mean by God? His answer was very interesting. Well, anyway, we'll get into that later. We will definitely. We'll also be talking in the future about Russia's robot lander and what happened to it on its way to the moon over the weekend. Or maybe well, pretty simple, it crashed. <laughs> I hope that doesn't bode toward our Artemis landing on the south part of the moon. Let's go to the sillies. We uh, get a lot of forwarded silly science cartoons from President Jerry. And this one took a while for me to figure it out. Resetting the alphabetical savings time clock. Simply yeah. write, write out the word starting at 1 p.m., which is an eight. And that's the first alphabetized word for a number, eight. And yeah. then 11 is also E. And then there's the F words, five and four. Uh, four is a four-letter word, too, starting with that one. <laughs> okay. And then goes all the way up to the T's. By any chance, you didn't save the ones at uh, Spam Collector. That's the email address of the uh, missing guest today. Murdoch. Yeah, his were not his were not unique, so I didn't show those. Okay, I finally figured those out. Here's a statement for you. Launch the show. NASA launching a new mission to say sorry to the aliens. They're calling it Apollo G. And here's a scene from <laughs> Picard and uh, later on Star Trek. Every morning I take my cow on a long walk through the local vineyard. Sounds like a Tom Whittemore joke. You don't mean. <laughs> yep. I heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> I heard it through the grapevine. Fun. Okay. And have another statement on the cosmos of, against the deep field. If we ever travel thousands of light years to a planet inhabited by intelligent life, let's just make some patterns in their crops and take off and leave. <laughs> They'll drive them nuts. That's how it's done. Types of solar eclipses. All right. This is uh, the top three, I think, are normal. Then it gets a little strange requires some mushrooms i noticed they didn't put in a flat earth one yeah true. Yes, it be a, yeah well, like edge of a disc sticking yeah. in you're right yeah i'm ron this october 14th will be an annular yeah is that right mm -hmm. yeah. for us it'll be a 70 percent partial yeah eugene oregon's gets a whole shooting match <laughs> don't we have two don't we have two blue moons this month yep yep I'll well two full moons first two August. full moons <laughs> well, this is funnier in hell. It's titled Extinct, a small dinosaur that didn't last versus T-Rex was the dreaded oh. Sarcastosaurus, the Don Rickles of <laughs> a soon extent. Wow, well done. You sure scared me, says to the T-Rex. You should pat yourself on the back. Oh, all right. You can't. Your arms are too short. And <laughs> it was delicious. Now, this is not astronomy, but it's definitely science. Uh, the Venus flytrap. One uh, trapped fly says to the other behind the bars, well, so much for your theory that Venus flytraps only eat flies from Venus. <laughs> it's up here because it says the word Venus. I'm sorry? It's I, it's included in astronomy jokes because it says oh, the planet oh, Venus. Oh, yeah, you're right. It can be. You're absolutely right. I've always wondered. Now, this one, I'm not sure I totally understand. It's, oh, this uh, is a meme about uh, how people... Um, the entire body of peer-reviewed scientific literature and a single fringe study of Netflix or Netflix documentary, and definitely not someone you should listen to. Yeah. But the general population seems to be able to understand conspiracy theories 
and the reality is just too complicated or too boring for them to follow. Okay, but that's exit 12. I swear that's the Ariaga. Yeah. I don't think this is anywhere local. You don't think so? It looks exactly Not with that cage over the off ramp or the uh, overpass. Okay, interesting stuff there. All right, and it says Easy Street on the overpass. Yeah. Oh, it does. oh okay. We couldn't see that. Here's uh, Calvin without Hobbs and going at the speed of light. Capri! Calvin, the human light particle in the blink of a eye, he's one hundred sixty-five thousand miles away. <clears throat> Nothing in the universe is faster than. Calvin, he hopes. I hope. he Notice this is not 186,000 miles away. So he's not at the speed of light. And a blink of an eye is not defined. Oh, okay. You know, it's it's one of the few cases where uh, kilometers kind of balances out. It becomes almost an even 300,000. Yeah, that's right. Three All right. To the 10 centimeters. This one's going to need some explanation, too. Magician says, I can make anything disappear. Tom holds up a cup, says, do it to my tea. And the magician waves his hand. Done. Ohm holding cup. It didn't work. You want to explain that, sir? Uh, his tea is the missing. Tea is gone. What? The, the tea, tea is, is gone. gone. Yeah. Oh. From, Tom, was... from the word Tom. Oh, I got it. I'm sorry. I thought that was a misprint. Okay. And okay. honor John Venn's. Now you're going to have to tell us who was there a John Venn? Yeah. Yeah. 108. He'd be 180 today or recently? A couple of days ago. And he was big on overlapping uh, bubbles, I guess. Big round. That theory. Diagram. That's yeah. Oh, okay. People who are 180 years old versus people who are still alive. There's no intersection. Right. Oh, there's there's no it. people 180 years old. So people <laughs> who understand Venn diagrams are here. People with a sense of humor, they overlap. And then the pe people who get this joke. It's pretty good. He wasn't an astronomer, though. I'm going to check. No. Out. He's a mathematician. Mathematician. Oh, one of those. Okay. Here is, a, is this a little bit of quantum. Is it a wiring problem, dear? He's got his head up in the ceiling uh, trap door and. She's coming out of the bottom of the floor trap door. Ooh, I think that might be a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, I got the general idea. Two things so this represents a mathematical property of modulo. <laughs> modulo. Yeah. All right, that's going to Where you go up. off the screen one way and you come back on on the other side coming in. It, the screen basically wraps or something. <laughs> I've often been curious if... if if the universe wasn't modulo with respect to size. Okay, but this is not a takeoff on the two electrons can be in different no. places, millions no. of miles apart. No. They're ex no. connected. They're, okay. Her head is only in one place. Do you got the cat one? Can you do the kitty cat with a head uh, coming through? I guess you can. No, that was last last week. We don't we don't go back and repeat. I thought I don't remember it on. I remember seeing it recently, but. Yeah, yes, it yes. was last week. Yeah. The black right. Well, gentlemen, uh, let's talk about the solar system and asterisms and Pegasus and all kinds of good stuff. I love this hour. I've got an article. Uh huh. What else? So, um, I've just got to do this a real quick one. So, Maureen okay. pointed out to me, New York Times yesterday, um, at Michigan State, they found the basically the foundation for a an observatory that was uh, from about 1888 it's pretty interesting so um 18 they were talking about uh, in one article i read they were talking about potentially finding some instruments and i'm thinking what <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah all they did was they found a circular foundation i think yeah. when they were digging and so they turned it into a student project where uh, the archaeology department is going to have students basically, you know, continue with the dig and see what they find. Ah, uh, free labor. Yeah. <laughs> well, plus, it's experience that they need to get a yes. job, and and it's otherwise hard for them because they got to travel to some far place. Yeah. So, yeah. my story, Ron, it was in yesterday's New York Times. Well, in Marine, Marine they, might, they might dig up some interesting instruments. There were good instruments back then, made by the oh, but, but they're only excavating a couple of inches of soil to oh. get to this uh, foundation. So okay. uh, maybe they'll find a twenty-inch Clark, huh, Chuck? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think now, they might find coins that. and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, they found some ancient ones too, back in Mesopotamia, two thousand, three thousand years ago. Haven't they found some ancient Arabic? 
places where they looked. I'm not sure what they'd have instrument wise. That was long before telescopes. Nevertheless, what do we have on the screen here? We're going to look at the solar system one planet at a time. Well, just let mention where everything is. Okay. Rise. So this is these are on on 24 hour clocks. Obviously, <laughs> you don't don't have the a.m. and the p.m. Yep. But yep. Mercury now rises in the morning. Uh, these are all local times. Uh, those these are all Pacific daylight times. Excuse me. So Mercury rises um, in the morning. Sets late at night. The, well, uh, and it's in Leo. Yeah, that's not real late. Yeah, that's pretty early. <laughs> it's, that's just after the sun goes down, you know, a bit. Like huh? A half hour after the sunset. Yeah. So you, it's too hard to see. I tried to find it at uh, Westmont on Friday when we did the outreach, and no, no luck. No luck. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, and we still have Pluto to, at the very end. It's amazing. Uh, we just can't get. I put them in. I put them in there just out of nostalgia. Oh, you're the one. Okay. <laughs> Technically, not, yeah. But Looking this all... stuff up is not that easy to find. All these things, everything goes off on tangents and talks about them, but they and they tell sometimes where to find them or a chart or something. But finding their actual rise and set time is pretty tricky for us. Well, you yeah. need your planetarium program. Yeah. <laughs> But it doesn't seem and to I have to run them. those about. There's there is one called an observatory, uh, an iPad um, um, app that shows a big clock, and then it'll show uh, a, a line going around for the planet. And so on that one, you can pick out the time of rising and setting. But it doesn't do all the planets. It only does um, the five: Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mm -hmm. So. Huh. There's uh, that, things like Sky Safari, you can do, they often have a button that just says tonight and you touch it and it'll tell you all the rise and set times and okay. any Good. transits of uh, Jupiter satellites, things like that. Yeah. Of but note I, here is that Jupiter is now creeping up to where it comes up about midnight, mm -hmm. sets about noon. So, and Saturn um, is a good object for what's this? Um, I think this is seven o'clock in that evening, 19? Almost yeah. eight. Yeah. I'll yeah. It's it's an opposition this week, I think, or next week. Yeah, very close. close. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem so like those are good objects, especially for outreach. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it was too long ago, gentlemen. That uh, several of them, half maybe half of them, were lined up in a row. Now every one of them's in a different uh, zodiac house. No, they're still lined up in a row. It's just that you have to turn your head 360 degrees to see the book. <laughs> Well, I, it means they're booking like crazy, my God. <laughs> it's like a NASCAR race. <laughs> the moon is now past new. Um, first quarter this Thursday, about 3 a.m. in Scorpius. So it's going to be low <laughs> in the south. That'll be neat for Bacara, Chuck. Yeah, yes. I, I don't think I'm going to make it, but... Yeah, uh, I, I'll be there. Tim will be there. Oh, Thursday, that's Friday. right. You're going to leave Friday. What does waxing mean? I mean, I know it's, it's, a, is it ancient? Growing, growing larger. Growing. growing. Yeah. It's from the German Voxen, which means to grow. Ah, and Wayne would be the other from end. The German, from the German Vanen, which means to, to diminish. And shrink. Okay. Got it. Fantastic. Right from the German. Okay. All right. Well, here's a picture of what the moon or. Yeah, this is a, a, a map of the moon. It's not a picture. <laughs> it shows because uh, the the um, shadows and details will be different when you look at it in reality in real time. But you're starting to see some real interesting stuff along the uh, Terminator here. So a lot of structure to look at, a lot of craters to look at. If you want to get a more realistic image, there's the um, NASA uh, Scientific Visualization Studio. You can enter a day and time, and it will give you a very realistic uh, view of what the moon will look like. Well, that's what I've got here. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's, I mean, it does the shadows right and everything. Too. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. Well, on, on Friday, I'm just going to compliment Tim. Tim Crawford, his, his telescope's just super. And he got the moon, um, really tiny crescent, Friday, Friday early evening. And you could see the Terminator going right through Mari Crisium. It's just absolutely beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is tonight at 9 p.m., local time okay 
is Tom uh, or Tim Crawford on board this morning? With he's us? texting. Yeah, he's watching. Oh, yeah. Hi, Super hi, Tom. <laughs> he's our, hi, Tim. He's married to Karen. This that yeah. way we'll make him our extra. Yeah. Bruce Murdoch married to Bonnie, but we don't know where Bruce is. There's the summer triangle: Cygnus, Lyra, <laughs> Altair, and his orchestra. Hercules. And this right down here, this is the finder chart for a uh, asterism, not a constellation, called the coat hanger, right. which is an oh. interesting thing for amateurs to look for in small scopes. Yeah, I think that's a colander object too, Jerry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Right. It's called Rocky's cluster, too. That's right. Right. Rocky. Well, that's the code. That's high to the Baron. Does it really have a good hook? For binoculars. Real nice for binoculars. All right. But if it's a coat hanger, does it have a hook? You'll mm -hmm. see. You'll see it. There it there is. There it is. Isn't that cool? I'll be damned. <laughs> it okay. consists of these six stars. One, two, three, four, five, six the shoulder to shoulder, and then these four stars for the hook, or the, these four, one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. for the hook. So it does look like a coat hanger. Yeah. And those, they don't happen to be close to each other at all. They're just lined up yeah. visually. Yeah, it's it's not even a, an actual cluster. They're just yeah. random. Yeah. Random yeah. lineups. Yeah. It's wrong, just happenstance, but very and they're very different kinds of stars. The color is good here. You can see blue stars, which are like hot, uh, mm -hmm. probably up to 60,000 degrees, and yellow to white, yellow and white stars. Okay. We can't see the red dwarfs, can we? There's millions of them. There, no, you can't see the red dwarfs in this picture. There's no, and there's no red giants I know of in. What what if they somehow portrayed all the red dwarfs? Put little pinprick red dots. Would it obliterate all the black? You'd see a lot more population on these maps. Mm -hmm. You can my my planetarium software, the Sky X um, and the Sky Six, its predecessor, will mm -hmm. let you adjust for how bright the stars are that you see. Yeah, and you can almost make the screen, you know, look like white noise. <laughs> like real deep. Wow. The the sky itself has about 6,000 visible stars over the whole sky. Is that right? And if you, and with these planetarium programs, and you bring out, that's down to magnitude six. And if you go down to magnitude like 12 or 13, you're into hundreds of thousands of stars. And it's just overwhelming. So patterns that you see, easy patterns like this, if you see all the stars or it's in a big scope, it just uh, is obliterated. Right. Yeah, this is in a pretty dense area of the uh, Milky Way, too. Yeah. Near the, near the coal sack. We were at a, I took a tour um, of the Big Islands telescopes in 2004, sponsored by Sky and Telescope, with Stephen O'Meara as the guide. And we were, we had a star party at the 9,000 foot level on Mauna Kea. Wow. And the sky was so brilliant with stars. That was probably the clearest, easily naked eye see to magnitude seven. Yeah. And we were looking up and he pointed out, we were going to look at the galaxy behind M13 in Hercules. Yeah. And I couldn't find Hercules. <laughs> because there were so many stars. Yeah. Yeah, 6207. So, sometimes... Those, 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 Pull that in on the eight inch at uh, Westmont for folks. It, it's really neat. It's really something. Yes. The Big Island supposedly has two active volcanoes. I'm assuming your observatories there are not on one of them. <laughs> it's on an old dead one, the, the tallest mountain in the Big Island. There, yeah, Mauna Kea. And that's the southern oh, the big one. That's I've forgotten the volcanoes out there. But, uh, <laughs> One of them, you can go up um, Volcano National Monument National Park. You can go up and you stay in a hotel that overlooks one, and the caldera fills up or goes down or spews up with a big fountain <laughs> in it over a century. You know, so I guess um, uh, Mark Twain visited in the 1800s and sketched a fountain of lava spewing up. Wow. 
when I was there, you could walk down into the crater and look down and you couldn't actually see any lava at all. But it's been much more active since then. And there's observatories up there. I don't know about Mona, about that up there near the, the actual volcano. <clears throat> I don't think so. I would think not. Yeah. Mauna well, Kea is separate from that. I wonder if in, on intelligent uh, planets, life out there sees our sun as one of an asterism for them. <laughs> or is our sun too small to be seen? Would we be one of the smaller stars? Depends, yeah. who's, depends who's looking. Okay. <laughs> or how close. Okay, where are we? M15. So this is you're near the star enough. And this is the finder chart to help you find M15. Mm -hmm. M15 well, is very interesting. Uh, nice object for small scopes. This is a larger scope. Hubble image compared to a 14.5 inch Ritchie Cretion telescope. And you can see right here where the arrow is. And you won't see the arrow in your scope image, but that is um, a nebula called planetary nebula called P's one, and it's within the globular cluster. So this globular this globular cluster has a star in it that's about the mass of our sun, and it came to the end of its life and it burped off its outer layers. And this is a close up image from Hubble shows three arc seconds, and three arc seconds. With a um, an amateur telescope, and where they're located, which is not frequently not the best place to be, uh, three arc seconds is about the size of a star that you get. If I were to image it, my stars would be about three arc seconds in diameter. Yeah. So this is three arc seconds. Obviously, Hubble is, resolves way farther than that, but the but the uh, fourteen inch uh, the stars are about that, about three. Uh, arc seconds across, and that's primarily due to the atmospheric seeing. How, so how many arc seconds do you get in a degree? Um, 3,600. Oh my God, okay. We're so there's 60 arc seconds in an arc minute and 60 arc minutes in a degree. Good Lord. And this, uh, this uh, globular also is thought to have a black hole at the core. So it's got a star that's the size of our sun and a black hole, and it's just one little blob in a jillion blobs there. And it's close to the center, I guess. Right? No, it's up, it's off offset. Here's the center there a little bit. It's not in the outer reaches. It was like our sun. Now it's a white dwarf. Well, did it go through a nova? No. 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 You can you can burp off your stuff without it being a kilonova or a hypernova or a yes. It's a planetary Correct. nebula. Oh. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think Chuck showed that Friday night, and I know Tim did too. Yeah. In fifty, yeah, it's really neat, really tight, real tight plot. And there's uh, obviously it's it's visible to people with good vision from really dark places because it's right off Enif, which is the nose of Pegasus. And there's mm -hmm. some Arabic story about a fly flying around the nose of the horse. <laughs> And is the Arabic for fly Enif? No. Yeah. No. Uh, no. So the fly is M15. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Enif is so, no. But this is the teeny little constellation of Equalus. Equalus? Equalus? Equalus. Isn't, isn't that horse? Yeah. That's little, little horse. horse. Little, little horse. Okay. Okay. So this is um, this is the constellation Pegasus, which is the big horse. Mm -hmm. And I think that Enif is the nose, correctly? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Hmm. I guess it would muddy things up to actually see the horse. It's, as now, a... when you're looking at this through an amateur scope, you want to put on an O3 filter, which lets the light of ionized oxygen through, but it suppresses all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, um, um, planetary nebulas just pop out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very high contrast. Makes it very right. easy to pick this out. Well, that's not a filter like looking at a uh, at yes. the sun. It uh, is. Oh, it is sort of like looking at the sun, where you black out the, the disk. You black well, out the wavelengths you don't want. Yeah. Right. So, so it's, it, it refers to the green line, twice uh, ionized oxygen, Ron. I got you. If, funny enough, oxygen three 
is two times ionized oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Here we are. Is this okay. our pay? Is this our Japanese comet? Yes, this was discovered very close to the sun by a fellow named Nishimura. Wow, not Alan, huh? <laughs> a what? Oh, Alan Nishimura teaches at Westmont. I, I know him. Oh. <laughs> His cousin Hideo Nishimura. Mm -hmm. wow. It was actually discovered on August 15. Wow. Well, oh, is it? No, it wasn't discovered. It was discovered on August 11. On August 15th, the Minor Planet Center officially confirmed the discovery and named it C2023P1 Nishimura. This isn't it's the same one we were talking about a week ago? No. Two weeks no, ago. this is brand new. Yeah, didn't know about this one. Yeah, and this one's on a hyperbolic trajectory, too. So well, it's well, one might time. Be a single, single pass, huh, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is making apparently its first pass from the Oort cloud is a suspicion. Okay. okay, then what kicked it into here? Why well, it was perfectly happy orbiting out there? Why did that, it just that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question? Because <laughs> <laughs> if it's a passing star, like I've heard the theory, it would knock a lot more than just Nishimura in here. It'd be hundreds, if not thousands, of rocks it could be a, it could be a wandering black hole it could be a wandering planet it could just be another um oort cloud object that came close well now oort cloud is a shell it's not part of a the ecliptic is it it's a big That's red correct, red. yes so it could, we could get comets from all directions i, I they're not all <laughs> on the ecliptic are they no that, or, that or, was the first hint that there was an earth oort cloud yeah is that right is uh, this one looks like it's on the ecliptic, but uh, maybe it's not. Well, this comet is believed it is projected to reach magnitude four eventually, or even magnitude two. Wow! But it's like rainstorms for Galita; it very yeah. seldom pans out. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you suppose it wouldn't just veer off into space instead of going back where it came from, like like a mua mua? which I know came from somewhere else, but what's the difference? Why, why wouldn't it just be like, uh, you know, the, the uh, planetary assistance? You know, they, we use planets to speed up. And it, well, that's what happened to it. And that's what kicked it in here is that it went close to some other body. Right. Oh, and if it accidentally comes close to another body, it'll get a new kick. But uh, comets don't ever go Wide out into space, never to be seen yeah, that's again. That's what this one's going to do, we think. <laughs> yeah, oh. Oumuamua did. Oumuamua came from and went to far yeah. space. Yeah. This one, they're not sure. You know, they think it's from the Oort cloud, but they think it's going to go escape the Oort cloud on the way out. Yeah. Uh huh. So it sucks some energy away from somebody who's probably going to be coming in later. <laughs> but it's not going to go by us close. Well, yeah. It looks yeah. like it's pretty close. Yeah, it's going to go. There's the Earth. So we got a fair distance. We're mm -hmm. not in danger from this one. And they're parabolas, or what are they? They, they are some form of conic section. Right. And this one's a hyperbola. Yeah. So they the can options go are circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, or parabolas. Mm -hmm. Haley's is on one of those because it repeats. Right? It's in an ellipse. An ellipse. And, and they think yeah. there are comets that'll just spin out and go away like Uma, 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 Uma did. Possibly. Okay. Maybe that's what happened with the Mua Mua. We got somebody else's comet from some other that's, stellar that's, system. That's why a Mua Mua is named what it's named. It's I1 Oumuamua, or I2 or something, Mua Mua for interstellar. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people went crazy thinking it was because of its shape. And it oh, was... people love a good story. <laughs> so Here we go. Looks like it's a morning object coming up, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Who are these constellations? We got a dog. Yeah, this is early in the morning. You can see uh, Gemini. He hasn't mm -hmm. been in the evening sky for a while. <laughs> we got that person right between the eyes with Pollux, didn't we? <laughs> yeah or is that an eye the right eye hmm. 
wearing a pair of dungaree pants. Oh, here we go. The nebula. Mm -hmm. Now we are, let's see, where are we? 28, 22. We're right here, August 21 today. So tomorrow it'll be here in Gemini, just like the previous thing showed. Mm -hmm. So, and during the next, what, August, September, almost October, it's going to move down to Virgo. So it's moving pretty quick. Yeah. As I say, uh, we see Gem, we see Castor and Pollux come up around four in the morning here, roughly, okay. just roughly. And the and sun's then, over there in Leo. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And this amateur Japanese astronomer just happened to stumble on it. There's no system. In I don't know the deep story on that, but he spotted it. So there's still several others out there, but this is the one we're concentrating on this week. Yeah. yeah. There's some other C-23, 2023. Okay. Oh, this is an amateur photograph of the comet, obviously tracked on the comet. So the stars and background stars are streaks. So it's a good one on spaceweather.com that shows Nishimura and um, going right by the Eskimo Nebula. Oh, oh, okay. When did that go up today? Uh, yesterday sometime, but it's still up today. You want me to call it up? Sure, if you can. All right, let's so we're not get out of this. This is not Nishimura's photograph right here. This is somebody else. Right, here it comes. Your AI, uh, uh, AI is not quite. Uh, is it okay if I share a screen here? Yes, I think so. Go ahead. Okay, and boom. Yeah, good. So there it is on space weather. Hmm. Can you blow that up? Uh, I'll try. Ah. Oh, you can see a you can see a better tail here going down. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's a faint galaxy right there. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't see my cursor. So. Yeah, but over here, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And there's the Eskimo Nebula up there. Yeah. Although that's now the non PC name. Now it's the Clown Face <laughs> Nebula. The Clown <laughs> Nebula? Clown Face. Huh. I don't see a tail, gentlemen. I don't, I'm sorry. Right here, Ron. Yeah. A very faint streak. Oh, it's pointing down? Yeah. Hmm. But so the... uh, you can tip this over and then it would point up. Yeah. But um, <laughs> all these names for things like Eskimo Nebula, the Triffid Nebula, the Lagoon Nebula, none of these are recognized names. They're all just uh, amateur appellations. But aren't tails on comets usually pointing away from the sun? Yeah, and this one is. Yeah. So the sun's, sun's up above. There. We're looking. Okay, it's upside down. The sun is to the above the picture. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. The Australian Ooh. view of things, perhaps. Okay. I love it. Thank you. Very neat. Little extra, beautiful. So, add that to them. Want to talk exoplanet updates? This is, um, we're not going to go through this in detail. Oh, dang, it didn't show up on this. Um, this is an app that allows people to um, take data and um, um, process it. And I thought we, I thought I had put the uh, HTTP, the URL up there on there. I will put it, it's called the uh, Exoplanet Transit Database. And this is a calculation shows the result of doing it. Uh, we won't stick with this, uh, except to say that TOI 4449.01b is an exoplanet candidate discovered by TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite in 2021. Um, next week, I'll put it up with the URL so you can see it in case people are interested. Well, do we know what starts around? Um, That's not on that there. Is the, that is the star, I think, TOI 4449.01. Oh. The B, the B is an exoplanet candidate. 
Yeah. A would be the star. So it's like Proxima B. Yeah. Yeah. Proxima is the star. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Now we're going to go to some very interesting topic, which I don't have a lot of illustrations for. Oh, at least fascinate me. Magnetars. Well, now you don't see this in a telescope. What we're looking at, that's depicted, right? Magnetic lines of force. Artist's representation. Yeah, this is this is a drawing. Um, okay. This and it shows what is in classical physics is a um, magnetic field, a dipole magnetic field for a current ring running around the equator of the star, which is the simplest um, oh. magnetic field shape you can generate. A lot of homework problems in magnetism, easy <laughs> to calculate, hairy math. But um, the point of this is two things about magnetars. Let's see if I... This shows um, this shows a magnetar before it's collapsed is the representation. It's a um, helium star that has a very intense magnetic field. Why it has that is not really well known. It's believed that uh, two small helium stars collided and somehow produced the original intense magnetic field. And then as the star collapsed into a neutron star, then it speeds up in the classic example of how a skater speeds up by conservation of momentum when they pull their arms in. The mass shrinks around it, and then you get these very intense, that magnifies the magnetic field and produces these um, quantum jets sticking out of the end of it. And let's see, let me just check this. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the object is that where these fields are um, terra, terra gauss God. <laughs> in some of these uh, things, which is incredible. The, the magnetic field of the sun on average is one gauss. The Earth's magnetic field is a fraction of that. The, um, in like the a lab, half. What's that? Like a half, just half, you know, yeah. roughly a half. Yeah. Okay. So um, in the lab where I worked in my graduate work, uh, we had a, a magnet that would do 20,000 20, gauss, mm -hmm. a superconducting magnet we built. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you get up to the size of these big magnetars, they are really ripping. They are, they are terra gauss of magnetic field. The um, magnetar like this that's producing these jets, it's easy to see where this um, hello. Yeah. The meeting code that you sent doesn't No, we we finished that. Go back to the old meeting code that we've always been using. I tried that also, and it didn't work. Oh, it worked for you guys, didn't it? Yeah, it worked fine. Yeah. yeah, everybody else said it worked fine. Try again. Well, I'll try again. Okay, bye. Uh, we're about to be joined by Bruce Murdoch. Yep. So um, the there's two stages, and the first stage of how how this got to be uh, the helium star got such a strong magnetic field. Once you get to this, it's easy to see how you generate this simply by collapse. But somehow the um, theory is that these these two smaller helium stars that are not very magnetic came together and spun up to produce this magnetic field. Now, the sun, for example, has a magnetic field that is not really, it's, it's like this, but it, inside and on the surface, it's highly twisted up and it's not really very strong. So the um, magnetic fields are very complicated in how they arise. There's many different kinds of magnetism, but they all involve a circulation, a little current loop of an electron that produces a little magnetic field. And they all either add up or they cancel each other out in various ways. <clears throat> so the details of the magnetar to start with, the helium magnetar is an unsolved problem. Hmm. 
And, and we know this how? Because of radio waves that come from it? Now, obviously, we don't see those lines. How do we know it's super magnetic? If there's, if there's material around, then, then, of course, we can see the polarized emission from the material. We can also look at lines that are emitted from the star, and then we can look at the um, Zeeman effect because magnetic fields split the spectral lines. So we can see the strength of the magnetic field from looking at Zeeman lines. But just like on the sun and on the earth, they come in on the North Pole and or go out the bottom of the, or sometimes they flip over, one's positive, one's negative. Super There's no charge. Yeah, that's the, the major difference between electric fields and magnetic fields is that electric fields start on one charge and end on the other charge. Magnetic fields are a product of charges in motion. And so they're created as a loop. There's no start and there's no end to it. It's just a loop. And these loops are not easy to break. Um, so they twist up as in, their, in a plasma like on the sun, they twist up and they will eventually stress themselves to where they break and then re can re-snap back together with some other available line. And you get a tremendous release of stored up energy. <clears throat> and, and did you say a moment ago that the sun had one gauss of this magnetism? One gauss, yeah, average, yeah. And yet you guys came up with a machine or a, I don't know, a big uh, magnetic coil. coil. Yeah. They gave 20? Yeah. 20,000. 20, no, 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 20,000. In fact, Jerry, I was going to say you beat us. So in Arizona, we made an eight Tesla superconducting magnet with... Uh, with um, basically trimming fields that were one part in 10 to the six. It was a lot of work in <laughs> graduate school. Yeah. yeah. Well, then does this affect any, they probably don't have exoplanets around these suckers, do they? Because of that. That would be very interesting because in a, what the magnetic interaction between an exoplanet and a magnetar would be. There have been exoplanets found around neutron stars, so it's not out of the question. Yeah. But with these kind of field strengths, trillions of tests of uh, Gauss, mm -hmm. atoms are um, atoms are distorted. basically distorted. They they look like little spindles. Um, you know, a, what is it? A prolate? No, it's, it's an oblate thing with points on the end. They look like stretched footballs. <laughs> the atoms do not have the same symmetry that they have when there's no strong magnetic field around. Well, that's what we're looking at. Bruce Murdoch, welcome aboard. Can you hear Very us? Cool. Yes, I yeah. can. You can hear okay. me. Are you on board what we're talking about? Magnetars from hell? Well, <laughs> I came in the middle of it, but I'm... Yeah. No we're about to shift to the... Um, ah, the dark cubesat. Yeah, this is um, ESA, European Space Agency, sent out a radar unit, a CubeSat, to Dimorphos. Yeah, yes. well, they haven't sent it yet. It's it's going to be on the way. Oh, right. that's true. Next year, right in September. I think You're this is this is an artist rendition of of uh, the satellite we hit with Dart. And this is the crater from Dart, and they um, this is the the radio wave or radar probe that they're planning to use. Um, oh. uh, this is the orbiting uh, moon of uh, another yes. your asteroid, isn't it? And, and we did exactly. it to see if we could uh, alter its orbit, and we did, and that's now they want to see what happened with the collision, I guess. And, they want and to look probe the interior. Right. Yeah. Oh. They want to know what happens, because if you get a loose asteroid like this and you hit it or blow it up or nuke it or do whatever you do to it um <clears throat> you you want it to move over you don't want it to come apart and and become a fatal meteor storm to us so they wow. need to know exactly what the, they did to the surviving moon uh asteroid so they're sending a couple of uh cubesats up to take a look they're about the size of a rubik's cube but they are a radar bouncing back type that's what we're depicting here is that a pretty accurate shot of what the asteroid looks like with the i have i have no idea 
that's know. that's a definite artist's rendition. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it says in the that's what it says in the title underneath the app the caption. This artist impression shows the blah yeah. blah. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it looked a lot uh, rubblier than that <laughs> in the close ups from Dart. Yeah, and we blew a lot of boulders off of it too, as you remember from from previous talks. And the it's thing that's now, the size of a Rubik's cube is the radar transmitter, not the entire cube set. Yeah. Well, what are they expecting to find in there? It's full of rock. Right. Well, they want to see what the interior structure is, if they're big yeah. voids or if, if it's bigger boulders or one big boulder. They classified the, the uh, mission as t taking gravimetric measurements, mineral surveys, and internal radar, and internal structure analysis. So they want to know the distribution of the gravity, um, what minerals are there, and um, what we did to it, how fractured we made it, how many boulders we blew off. Cube sets are 10 centimeter cubes. Yeah, they're very small. Is on the side. And they're radar units? They're like little radars? No, you can put a radar in them. And the radar unit in this one is the size of a cube, Rubik's cube. Mm -hmm. Well, we're seeing something with a big, long uh, pair of uh, solar panels. Yeah, they sprout yep. out from it. Uh, yeah. Oh, otherwise, that's just it up. Okay. That's where they get their power and their electricity. No, there's a there's a there's a cube set there, Ron. You're not seeing the the little Rubik's cube size radar transmitter. It's inside that box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're going to launch this from Guiana down in the equator of that's South America. The ESA site. Yeah. Is this just a European afterthought or has this been planned? No, no, no it's a planned plan. mission. Era. Oh, okay. It will be launched in October, 2024. Oh, I thought it was September, but could be wrong. Yeah, you're right, October, 2025, that's next year. Right before the election. So we routinely make the, the, the ability to make very small, but very powerful and effective radar units uh, is, very well established. We put them in the heads of uh, missiles, um, small missiles, um, and aircraft, so that we can make very, very powerful radar sets. Well, we map the surfaces or go inside Mercury and Venus and places like that using virtually the same thing or larger units, you suppose. Well, the surfaces on Mercury, et cetera, are too dense for the radar to go very deep. Uh, this thing, if it's uh, you know powdery, then the radar might be able to get into the interior. Yeah. Okay. They're We're... saying it can go almost you know past the center of it, past the centroid. So, but it's if they very small. To orbit around or it's rotating, they'll they'll get a few of the entire interior. Mm -hmm. We've got a look at the interior of Mars as defined by the first top top two meters or so. With, yeah, uh, yes, that's, that's what I was saying, you know, because it's an evanescent radiation. The the, the uh, signal strength drops off exponentially with distance once you hit yeah. the surface. I think we've shipped, switched over to shape shifting, gentlemen. We've only got a few minutes, so I want to cover a few quick points here. <laughs> shape shifting is us, our us, galaxies. So, galaxies in collision. Ooh. Okay. It's definitely. So slow this motion. is the old Zwicky. Um, Y shape Hubble, Hubble, excuse me, yes, that was um, proposed for the evolution of galaxies, how galaxies evolve. But this is really just a classification of galaxies. It did not represent, it was very puzzling how they evolved into this shape. And so, this uh, there's a paper published now that covers that. And um, looking at 100 galaxies in both visible and infrared light from the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope, they found that the, the, the solution to making that classification into an evolution is that there are two different types of bridging lenticular galaxies, which was not appreciated before. One version is old and lacks dust, and the other is young and rich in dust. <clears throat> when dust poor galaxies accrete dust, gas, it creates spiral arms when Dutch risk, Dutch risk rich lenticular galaxies uh, are created when spiral galaxies collide and merge. 
is that um, the Milky Way actually lies between dust rich and dust poor lenticular galaxies in the Hubble sequence. So they worked out the, the sequence that gives us, um, have brought us to the present Milky Way structure. And it's fraught with many uh, different stages and violent history that they likened it to an business acquisition or merger. Hmm. I guess it's a hostile takeover. Yeah. <laughs> but how many, have they got Ed, nailed as to the percentage? Aren't most galaxies big spinning spirals? They did not like address that. Oh. I'm sure that statistic is out there. I'll look it up for next time. So, so uh, lenticular, how, what's, what does that look like? If it's not a ball of elliptical. Lent, like a lentil. Lens. Lens. Like a lens? Did you say lens? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's long, thin with a fat tummy, like a worm that swallowed something. Oh. Another sort of stretched and flattened football. Yeah. Right. So, Ron, do you know what a lentil looks like? I've beaten them, but yeah. they're kind of small. <laughs> That's where the word lenticular comes from. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, apparently there are some spirals that don't really stick out into space. They sort of collapse around each other and it's like a self-contained spiral. Do you, yeah, there's the, that's the one, that's us, right? Bard, this is an bard. artist impression of us and the barred spiral, the barred part, they believe from this paper is a very recent addition to the galaxy. <laughs> God, it's just amazing. Everything's moving. Everything's either spinning. Mm -hmm. I wonder about the elliptical ones, though. Uh, are they spinning? They are. They are moving. They are rotating. They're they're all their stars are kind of in individual orbits that are randomized. So it's not like you have an overall spin. Okay, a lot of binaries, I'll bet. But then that's true here too. You know, they they meet. <laughs> they, for some reason they never collide. Well, they do collide occasionally. We talked about that earlier, but okay. So the words that we learned are spiral appearance and uh, spatiation, galactic spatiation. Did you want to Speciation. comment on that? Yeah. Is that what we're talking about here? Species, different species of galaxies. That last picture showed a uh, black hole that you just... Yes, yeah. this is M87, which is a um, irregular elliptical galaxy, not a spiral. And that's why it was picked because you can see right to the core of it. And that's the black hole that was first imaged, uh, the accretion disk around the black hole. And it so the, like the, the Virgo, the Virgo group. Wow. Those are radio images, I gather. This yeah. looks like a James Webb because it's got the six. Oh, that's right. I noticed that. But oh. they didn't refer to James Webb. Huh. Well, maybe it's another scope like Spitzer that has a similar structure. Yeah, it mm -hmm. could be. So we're not looking at a full face of a disk at this black hole. It would look it's, like it's like a it's warping space. So no no part of anything behind it is obscured and and it's weird. Yeah. But we're seeing a black hole in the middle of that lit up orange. That's animal. called the shadow of the black hole. Yeah. Okay, but would it look the same from all angles, from all directions? Would it look Pretty like much? That? Yes, because the hmm. uh, the black hole uh, bends light around it. So you see stuff that's behind the black hole over the top and over the bottom from wherever you look. But the lit up part is the accretion disk, right? Yes, the bright, bright orange yellow part. But it is called a disk. <clears throat> yes. Accretion disk is not an accretion uh, shell. Sphere, yeah, but it's a disk, board. but you're seeing the disk on the other side of the black hole too. Yeah. Okay. And ours it's, and our, the one that the young man came from LCO and talked about it, they, he was involved in photographing the Milky Way's uh, black hole, supermassive, and it looked just like this one. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much that's what they look like. You get a close-up view if you watch the movie Interstellar. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you get a big arc across the top of the uh, black hole that is actually the backside. Yeah. Top of the we backside, like and under it, you see the bottom of the backside. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. The YouTube video with Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about, are we all living in a big black hole? <laughs> We're actually kicking around some strange theories, gentlemen. 
Mm -hmm. Have we run out of time? I think we have. Uh, so the hollows was the word that I alluded to at the beginning when I said, is there a sleepy hollow or a sleepy one on yeah. the surface of Mercury? We can talk about this next week. And well, you can. I can. I can. Uh, it's a lot of pictures that I think are pretty cool to look at, but they take a lot of time. I think I can fill you in that the, the messenger satellite or one other one that went by first, but got low resolution pictures, saw a lot of bright spots and messenger, messenger saw a lot of things that were um, bright spots and holes without any crater rims on them. And so those have been referred to now as hollows. And they're, and they're all, all over the place, and they're believed to be the result of sublimation of some easily sublimable chemical okay. uh, due to the constant proton bombardment and heat of the of the nearby sun. And they're only on Mercury. They're they're not featured on the Moon or any other planet. No, I haven't I haven't seen pictures of them anywhere else. They That's may be cool. similar to those bright spots on Ceres where you have the salt bubbling up. Yeah, yeah. I got you. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Outreach, uh, you're going to be leaving us, but uh, I guess you and Pat are going to Ireland, and then uh, we've got two items next week. One of them is Kachuma, and the other is Carp Beach. What, what's our no. outreach? No. This week uh, on Thursday, it's Bacara, Friday's Refugio, Saturday's Kachuma. Ah. And then on the 31st is Bacara, on the 1st is our monthly meeting, on the 2nd is Refugio. Well, your assignment is to try to catch our act online in Dublin, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think I'll be absent for the next couple. Well, yeah. okay, but you might. We'll miss you. Yeah, we'll miss yeah. you. And when you get back, you're going to miss a good speech from Dr. Callis of JPL in a couple of weeks. Gentlemen, thank you. And uh, I guess we've worked everything out. I got sun out. You never know. There was a hurricane that passed us today. But this is your SBAU Astro Hour, Ron Heron and the gang. Tom and the rest of you, Chuck, Jerry, thank you. Uh, Bruce, take care of yourselves.